you say you want $5 million worth, I'm not getting it for you. You want a, maybe 50, 100,000 worth, I'll find it. I'll get it if I don't have it. It's available. It's there. Higher prices will pull it out. But how much is available? I mean, not a lot. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And it is our regular Tuesday segment where we check in with Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin to find out what is happening on the physical level of the silver market. Again, often diverges a bit from the paper markets that we see on the COMEX, which uh, is why it's good to have him here each week, find out what is actually going on in terms of the order flow. So, Andy, welcome back in. It's great to see you here as always. And how are you doing today, sir? I'm good, my friend. How are you, Chris? Thanks for having me, buddy. Well, I'm doing well. And so far, another slow, quiet week to the gold and silver prices. And I guess it's interesting as we're approaching the debt ceiling, which Janet Yellen is telling us is potentially the catastrophe to end call all catastrophes. And sometimes I go back and forth wondering is... We did have a technical default or a temporary delay. Uh, how much of that is scaremongering? How much, how, or how catastrophic could it really be? I suppose we'll possibly find out in the next week or so. Although so far it's been a quiet time in the gold and silver market. And uh, perhaps we could start there and see. I, I know the last couple of weeks things have slowed down in terms of the premiums have come back in a little bit what customers are doing has not been as frantic, but curious what you're seeing there. And perhaps we can begin with that. Yeah, business has been strong, but premiums, I mean, it hasn't been frantic. I mean, that's the best way to explain it. And it's just my disbelief at how short people's memory is and how they cling on the moment to moment price and, and information instead of looking at the big picture. And I mean, I microeconomics, and, and looking at things in that way have never really registered with me. I look at things on a big picture. I try to look at things from a macro perspective and from a macro perspective, fundamentally, mathematically, I don't see a way out of this mess. I don't see how you ever pay off what amounts to almost $200 trillion in both on and off balance sheet obligations without utilizing the printing press or just outright default. I don't think that this will be an outright default. Obviously, they have the printing press. They can continue to print their obligations. But I do think there's a high probability of it being what's called a technical default. And you could say that by just how fast and far the credit default swaps have gone up backing the treasury market, which is impl or, or implying a possibility of a technical default where they shut the lights off for a little bit to say, we're not budging, well, neither are we. Well, then the lights go off. Well, that's what the spike in the credit default swaps and the nearly 6% yield on the one month treasury have been saying this whole month. So I guess we will have to see Janet Yellen did say dozens of banks would fail if indeed that did happen. Is she bluffing? Don't know. Like you said, I guess we will have to see. But in terms of the way that it has um, worked out here in the precious metals market, premiums are subdued. Demand is still very strong, but not frantic. Availability is good, um, really, other than the Silver Eagle and to some extent pre-65 silver and the numismatic gold. Those have really taken off. It's interesting, anything with a, with a U.S. stamp on it has gotten very, very expensive. And, and I, you know, the, the gold eagle, the gold buffalo, one ounce, not outrageous, but the fractional gold coins, the silver eagle and the pre-60, pre-33 gold coins are all really, really, really strong and, and haven't come down at all. In fact, have it continued to slightly move higher. And I'm curious about the junk silver market. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago when we had Bill Holter on together with you. And you guys were saying that the supply of junk was getting really tight. Obviously, they are not making more of that. Has that changed at all? Has there been any more supply coming online? Or is that still... You know, I mean, uh, it's, that... it's available in, in, in um, waves, but not a lot. I mean... So you say you want $5 million worth, I'm not getting it for you. You want a, maybe 50, 100,000 worth, I'll find it. I'll get it if I don't have it. 
it's available, it's there, higher prices will pull it out, but how much is available? I mean, not a lot. The people who have been holding junk silver are the ones who get it. They're the they're the ones who are are diehard uh, gold and silver bugs. They are the ones that have held on to it longer than people who come on late in the game. They understand the significance of it, whereas it's not pretty and fun to look at. Dirty dimes and quarters minted prior to '65, whereas a you know a a shiny American Eagle. I thought I had one around here somewhere. Yeah, you know, a, a shiny American Eagle or a one ounce bar, you know, those are pretty and fun to look at. And you can't say that about pre-65 silver, but by the same token, the people who accumulate it understand the significance of it. So yeah, it's available, but premiums are still really elevated. Available is very subjective. It, it, it means that there's some available, but in terms of you know, if we have another whale client say, I want $30 million worth of only junk silver, it's not going to happen, at least for a very long time, if at all. I mean, are we another surge away from when it just becomes completely unavailable, aside from if the price goes up high enough that you get a few people selling in some of their uh, their supply into the secondary market? Are we still... Depends what that surge looks like. I mean, is that surge your friends that you you went to that you were with on wall street or your friends that you went to wharton with are these your friends or the people that are out there outside the crowd outside this this group of people who understand who've been following you and others for the last decade it's when it reaches the mainstream and the mainstream has so much money that it won't take but just a little dabbling from the mainstream and it would take bank failures or some sort of instability the treasury market really taking it on the chin or some event like you mentioned that has to bring in more of the mainstream and and i think when that happens it's like that it's gone and that's kind of the delineation in this industry one day it's plentiful and the next day it's not and that's always come in the context of a very confined community open that up to the fact that, you know, you look at silver in comparison to so many other financial assets and you can make such a strong argument for it. And there have to be people out there who have noticed silver or will notice it and gold when whatever that event triggers happens. And there are very few places that I think you, you could look to with the intention of, of being safe with the intention of preserving um, with the intention of making it through whatever the significance of that event is. And yeah, so we are just one event away if it expands into the mainstream, if it's a really scary event, if Janet is right, 25 banks. Fell. I mean, shit, the, mm -hmm. the, the Fed says there's 722 banks that are technically insolvent. There are other people saying that it's two or three times that. Well, what happens if a hundred banks were to fail? Bang, like that, the whole world would freak out. And that's your event and there's nothing left. If it's just another event that that us hard money people um, interpret, yeah, it'll make it tougher to get. There'll be some more availability down the road. It's when the mainstream enters this market that it'll really change because there's so much wealth out there. And, and most of it, they've never even thought for a second of owning gold and silver until all of a sudden they realize that was a mistake. Well, speaking of the mainstream, we're maybe getting a little bit closer uh, as a story that Steve St. Angelo noted in his column last week was that BlackRock has taken a big stake in the PSLV fund, which obviously is interesting because BlackRock, emblematic of that mainstream that you talked about there. And I guess the week before that, we had Bank of America putting out their report on silver. Uh, a couple of weeks before that was Citibank talking about silver. So um, did you happen to catch that that note about BlackRock and any thoughts on if we're getting a little bit closer to seeing some of that mainstream interest? Well, it's interesting when you look at Ted Butler, what he has to say. Um, he didn't mention this, but he talks about the fact that as silver has gone up like six bucks over the last several months, that the commercial banks have not shorted the rise in price. He interprets that as being very different than it ever was and that they understand the significance 
of being short in this market and how dangerous that is. And he, he speaks to one managed money trader who has flipped sides and is massively short. And he thinks, he says, I wonder if it's BlackRock. It would be interesting if BlackRock was suppressing the paper price to accumulate a whole bunch of physical. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me one bit at all. Don't know if that's the truth, but yeah, I mean, I think it would it would be foolish of a company that is as supposedly sophisticated and plugged in as BlackRock. I mean, they once were one of the primary custodians, if I'm not mistaken, of, of SLV, and, and now it's just JP Morgan, I think, but they were involved with uh, the, the SLV fund to some degree, and I think they would be foolish to not own silver, and, and, and it would also not surprise me one bit at all if they were using the that playbook of suppressing paper to accumulate physical. Certainly they have enough money to do it and then to paper over their shorts. It's when you get called to the carpet and those short positions, whoever takes the other side demand delivery, that it becomes very dangerous. So what Ted was saying was that he thinks the commercial banks are wising up to this and are not actively shorting the rising price, which has always been their standard playbook, indicating that they may be backing away from the suppression. Who is this one big managed money trader? He thought maybe it was BlackRock. So I guess only time will tell, but it wouldn't surprise me. Well, we did see a bit of a reduction of the bank shorting in last week's COT report. Here we see the swap dealers uh, reducing 3,800 shorts, adding 2,200 longs. Still, still short about 9,000 contracts. And they've gotten back to even on some of the past pivot points where we've seen the price start to rebound. So still somewhat short, but. Uh, Put that in context, 9,000, what is, what is the registered category now? 29 million. So they're short 9,000 contracts. That's what almost 50% more 40, somewhere like that percent more than the, the number of contracts that are, that are bars that are backing availability for delivery. In other words, when we figure out last Last week, 6,000 plus contracts, that's it, available. And if everyone stood for delivery. So they're they're short 9,000 against 6,000 contracts. So, I mean, what if what if people said, I, I just, I want delivery? Where are they going to, where's it going to come from? If there isn't even that much silver in the registered category. That's, that's the point that, you know, this is the nickel market moment. This is that moment where when that happens, if all of a sudden people say, no, 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 we, we don't want cash settlement. We're standing for delivery. What happens? When does the rubber meet the road? Don't know. But it just seems we're getting closer to that moment. And when there is that event where the public gets really keenly in, interested in precious metals, things will start to speed up all over the place, and including on COMEX would be my guess. Do you think that uh, I mean, this is a little bit of an unfair question because obviously no one knows, but do you, do you think that's how this will play out, that we will reach a point where there's just a run on the deliveries and 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 that's what ultimately sparks this? Uh, obviously, you've been thinking about this for decades and a lot of different ways things could go, but do you think that's how this does end up going? I do, and that's why you've seen a slow methodical drawdown over the years, and they've been doing it slowly enough so as to milk as much out of the system as possible while injecting volatility into the equation, keeping it in a trading range, counterintuitively smacking it when people would think it should go higher, allowing them to pickpocket all of the world silver, not just here, but you're seeing it happen even on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Tons of silver being taken off. You're seeing it in, in uh, Dubai. You're seeing it off of the ETFs. You're seeing it off the London Metals Exchange. These are sophisticated players. They know what they're doing. And if they want to do it, they'll milk as much out as they possibly can until it becomes obvious that only one drop of milk left, guys, and bang, it just, that's how fast it'll happen. I do. I think just like, you know, there's all people, you always hear this over and over, over again in this industry, you know, talking about, uh, what's his name, Hemingway. He went broke little by little then all at once. Well, you, you've seen, we've documented it, a drawdown from all of the world's exchanges little by little. And then all at once. And, you know, 120 million ounces or so have disappeared off the registered category in the last year and a half. You know, give it time. And uh, I think you'll see 
that drawdown or just off, not off the register, but off the entire COMEX ecosystem. I don't know how much has come off the register, but a lot. And anyways, the bottom line is, is that it's disappearing and it's being slowly accumulated and leaving the ecosystem. So yes, I think they have been doing it little by little until it becomes obvious that no one wants to sell it anymore. And then it happens all at once. And I think an event would only accelerate that. I mean, look at that. If that isn't a precipitous drop, yeah. So from 160 to 30. So you got 130 million ounces have disappeared since 2021 silver squeeze. And, you know, how people don't notice that and talk about that all the time, they're not paying close enough attention. And what does that chart really signify? It says that the most sophisticated, well-informed, influential money in the world is draining the exchange of silver. And the gold warehouse, I, I would assume, looks similar to that as well. And, and so you're watching big money use the suppression of price and rhetoric to run cover for exactly that until there's no more left. And this is a prime example. If we're at 30 million at 5,000 ounces a, a contract, that's 6,000 contracts that are available for delivery or bars, 6,000 contracts if everyone stood for delivery, but the commercial banks alone have 9,000 short. What does that say to the legitimacy of the market where the tail wags the dog, where the futures contract drives the price of the underlying commodity? It says it's given them the ability to do this by using the manipulative um, infrastructure of, of this equal, of the, of the COMEX, of the LBMA. They've been able to control price, which allows them to quietly pull things off without anyone noticing. And uh, that demand, as I keep saying, is betraying the value of the metal. It betrays the, the rhetoric. It betrays all of the counterintuitive negativity. Yeah, the price action sucks and has for a while, but look at that. If if price was really indicative of demand, then who the hell is buying all of this and where is it going? That's a lot of silver to be taken off 130 million ounces, you know, since January 2021. So, yeah, I do. I do think that's exactly how it'll happen. And speaking of the price, I'm curious, uh, obviously you have a couple of different hats you're wearing there. You're running a business. You have customers that are obviously, in many cases, concerned about the price. But aside from your role as running the gold and silver shop, just personally from your own investment standpoint, do you care about the day-to-day -day price? Or do you just, in terms of how you handle it internally, do you just think about it from a long-term standpoint? And back to what you said earlier of how, well, there's the unfunded liabilities, there's the debt, there's the degree to which, whether it's this year or some future year that the Fed seemingly has to step back into the market. Do you get to that point where you almost, aside from the business standpoint, just don't care about the price in the short term? And and, and if you weren't running uh, Miles Franklin, would you look at the chart every day? Or I'm curious how you see that. That's a, that's a very fair question. And I know it's something you and I have talked about a lot in other ways offline, but it's frustrating. Um, you want to be right. And the people you're trying to help, you want them to see that you are doing your best to help them and and that the price is actually following a, logic, a logical pattern or pathway. And then you see the counterintuitive drubbing and smashing that, that we've become accustomed to that is disheartening and frustrating and aggravating. But to your bigger point, I see the bigger picture. Mathematically, it's an inevitability. And I guess because I've spent so much time doing this, that last chart you showed me is what allows me the peace of mind. Because the people that are draining the metal from these exchanges are the most sophisticated players in the world. They are closest to the information. There would be no reason to take physical possession of thousand ounce silver bars that weigh nearly 80 pounds uh, to the tune of 130 million ounces disappearing if it wasn't incredibly important. The same thing is being true, uh, you could say, of gold, which is being drawn down across the world as well. And the central banks buy more than any time in the last 18 months than in all of history. The biggest money in the world who has the biggest money but is closest to the information 
is showing you the playbook. And they're using the suppressed price to drive us all crazy. But driving us all crazy means keeping us away from this, keeping us away from what they're trying to accumulate because there is such a small amount versus a tremendous amount of money. And well, people say, why don't they just buy it all up? Well, they could, but then that would be it. And that would alert everyone of its true value. Instead, keep it volatile, make it counterintuitive. And when everyone is just not even looking at it because it's blasé and it, it's it's no longer relevant, it's, a, it's an archaic thing of the past, and it doesn't perform the way it's supposed to when the world is on fire, it gives them the ability to drain 130 million ounces in a year and a half. It gives them the ability to drain the LBMA, not just of silver, but of all of the commodities and of gold. And this is done very strategically. It is very well thought out. And that to me is what gives me comfort. And, you know, I, I that's the truth. It's frustrating as hell. I get it. It bugs me too, because you want to be right. But to me, they're proving to me that I am right and that you are right. And they're just using the logic that we present to people as their reasoning for accumulating the metal, but they're using the suppression of the price and the rhetoric to run cover for it in a world where information travels so rapidly. If they, if they were any more transparent with their intentions, they would be crowded out of their trade in 30 seconds and it would no longer be the same type of value to de-dollarize into it would it would very quickly render their trade uh upside down so yes it's frustrating i get your question but the biggest money in the world allows me to sleep at night showing me what they're doing all right and uh in terms of dissuading people from owning metals i know you mentioned something to me over the weekend that you were hearing from some of your customers in regards to the issues they're having with their banks, even sending wires, and perhaps you could share share that for us. Yeah, we had two separate clients um, from two separate banks, one a big commercial bank um, and one a regional bank. And both clients received, they did the wire online and got confirmation that the wire was on the way. In both cases, they were called by someone at the branch, branch manager or uh, someone close to that level, who said that the wire was canceled and that they wanted to set up an appointment because buying gold is risky and you can lose money and they wanted them to come in and talk about it. In both cases, they were told to pound sand and they sent checks overnight. But the fact that banks are stopping wires, two of them, one from a major commercial bank using the, well, buying gold is dangerous and risky uh, it is, is, I don't know, it seems illegal to me more than anything. It's, it's really kind of frightening. You can tell they're not wanting to let go of the money uh, any way they can. And I, I've read recently of, of banks employing, uh, creating a new division called client retention, where they're doing their best to keep people from leaving. You know, they've always said, what are you going to do with that money over the last few years when you go and try to withdraw it? Now they're just saying, no, we're not going to wire the money for you because buying gold is dangerous. Well, you know, what does that tell you? The, the banks are on thin ice. And the more money that keeps that keeps leaving the system, and it's billions by the day, hundreds of billions, the, the greater the chance of more instability and, 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 and bank runs and bank failures. And I think we have yet to even begun to begin to see the end of this banking problem. I believe it will define 2023. I think the second half of this year, you will see, if I had to guess, a lot of banks fail. And uh, part of me believes that's exactly what they're trying to accomplish. Pen everyone into those commercial banks and roll out that CBDC. Just go research Lael Brainerd for a little bit, <clears throat> who we've talked about her, was at the Treasury, was second in charge at the Fed, and then is now advising the president. And her whole her whole pathway is, is all the banks gone and, and modern monetary theory working directly with the Federal Reserve. Well, it just seems as though by continuing to allow the money markets into the reverse repo market, you are just aiding and abetting this. It's not ending. And I think, uh, yeah, I think there'll be there'll be a lot of chaos over the next several months, if I had to guess. Well, it's going to be interesting to see. Obviously, it seems as if we're getting towards the end of those rate hikes, although 
Still, uh, on Monday morning, we had Neil Kashkari say that even if they pause at June, could conceivably not be the last hike, which um, will be interesting to see just how, how far they continue to go. Yeah, I mean, why, why, their rate hikes are bumpkiss. I mean, yes, they've gone from zero to 5% in, in under a year. That's a lot, or a year. That's a lot. But it's still below the level of inflation. I looked the other day at uh, John Williams' shadow stat. He's saying inflation right now is like 9% according to the way it used to be measured, not the six or seven we're being told, but it's still below 10-year treasury at under 4% is still yielding a negative real return, even by their own numbers of almost 3% compounding. So they have to continue to raise rates. If they don't, it's just inflation is here forever, but it is because how do you pay off the, the 200, almost $200 trillion in obligations on and off balance sheet, the 77 trillion in social security alone? How do you pay it off? You don't. You monetize the debt. That's hyperinflation. You print or you default. And when the world is no longer accumulating our treasuries the way they once and in fact are selling them, I think it only adds concern or a, a more realistic view that, yes, Richard Russell was right 20 years ago when he said the Fed had no choice but to inflate or default, inflate or die. And that really, to me, is their only playbook. Yeah, it does seem that way. And uh, again, it's amazing that we have another debt ceiling coming up, which seems like a lot of resistance to do and doing any sort of real significant cuts, which on one hand, I understand. On the other hand, you know, if you haven't done it to this point, when does it get any easier? I don't think that it does. And perhaps that's what's led us to gold and silver, where you, you see that dynamic and, you know, it's, Easier to say, but the, the that's when the math comes in. You start withdrawing money from the system and I think has led you and I to believe that it is a bit of a mathematical impossibility. So um, don't think the foreigners who are de-dollarizing aren't watching this mess. And this is another reason why they're moving so quickly to reduce dependency on the dollar it, for these reasons amongst others but the mismanagement we can't get our act together at home and we're doing dumb things abroad and we're losing credibility and trustworthiness so yeah I, I think this is a big deal Chris and I guess we'll have to see how it plays out Janet Yellen said June 1st is the drop dead date so we got what is it eight days or so until that happens we'll see if they uh, get past this this stalemate, I have a feeling they won't, but I guess we'll have to see. Either way, it doesn't change anything. So, I mean, that's the funny thing. The market will blow off, stocks will go up, gold will come down because we got a new credit card that we can max out after we've maxed out the ones before it. So is it really a good thing when they raise the debt ceiling or is it just an embarrassment? And I would argue it's an embarrassment, but yet the market will react the opposite of that. If, it, if the market were smart, I would say, for Christ's sake, they, they've signaled the fact that they have no choice but to continue to inflate forever. Talk about normalizing the balance sheet. They'll never do that. You know, when Bernanke did QE, he said it would be a short-term thing and that because he was being accused of monetizing the debt and he said, no, it'll be a short-term thing and you'll know when it's over when we start to sell off our balance sheet. And that was when they had 800 billion on their balance sheet. Now we got 9 trillion and we can't get to 8 trillion without blowing everything up. So it has been quantitative easing, it has been monetization and it will continue to be because if not, everything blows up. <laughs> and that's really the crux of all of this. And to look at it as a good thing that they raise the debt ceiling so that they can spend more money that we don't have and continue to give money to the Ukraine and bankrupt our country, it's not a good thing. It just is just more continuation of the same crap that we've experienced all this time. Well, it's certainly going to be a wild week and a half especially with the debt ceiling coming up. And I'm sure we will hear a lot of on again, off again headlines that imagine it could be a volatile week coming up and we'll see how that ultimately gets resolved. But remember, even if it's resolved, it's not resolved. It's just kicking the can further down the road, screwing our children even more and our grandchildren. Yeah, the deadline gets resolved. The underlying issue doesn't. So Again, perhaps we're a little biased here, but that's why we turned to gold and silver. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Andy, for people who see that perspective and are interested in purchasing silver, anything that's on special this week for people who are looking to add to their stack right now? A 10 ounce Itala, Ital Preziosi, Italian 10 ounce silver bar. They're beautiful. They're really, really, really nice. Um, and they are on sale right now at $3.49 over the price of silver. All right. Well, appreciate that. And if anyone is interested in that or has questions about gold and silver or anything else along those lines, you can find out more at Arcadia at milesfranklin.com. And Andy, appreciate you joining us as always this week. And it will be interesting to see how this resolves or at least what we're looking at by next Tuesday. So it should be a fascinating week in the financial markets. And anyway, thanks for being here. And we'll look forward to checking back in with you next week. Take care, my man. Thanks. Well, thank you, Andy, as always, for this week's update. Great to find out what is going on on the physical level of the silver market. And certainly should be interesting to see how things develop over the next week as we near that debt ceiling debate. And thought he had a good point there on how even if it is resolved in the short term and extended, again, somewhat ironic in that a resolution of the debt ceiling leads to more of the issues that have caused it to be a problem in the past. But we will just follow along and see how it goes. And lastly, before we wrap up, I'd like to thank BlackRock Silver, who brought us tonight's episode. And BlackRock did have the final results back from their drilling program at their lithium mineralization project at Tonopah North. They did get the last three drill holes back, which showed, once again, intervals exceeding 1,000 parts per million on all three holes, which left them in a position where all 11 core drill holes intersected grades of over 1,000 parts per million. These results were in a range of 36 to 85% higher than the reverse circulation drill holes that BlackRock did, where they discovered the initial mineralization late last year. So congratulations to BlackRock as they continue to move that project forward, along with Tierlock Resources, who is doing the drilling there for them as part of their joint venture agreement that they have. And to read the whole press release, that link is in the description field below. And good for BlackRock that in addition to their gold and silver project at Tonopah West, as well as Silver Cloud, that they also do have this lithium mineralization. So again, link in the description field below. We're going to wrap up for today, but thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you again tomorrow.